Hi, good afternoon. If, uh, if you guys are here for the, for the session, would you mind coming a bit closer so we don't feel like stranded, you know, somewhere you know, in the middle of the ocean? So please join us at the front. Otherwise, we, go, we might go there and grab you and bring you here. Thank you. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we know, I mean, we, we really thank you for coming at 3 p.m., you know, I know it's a, it's a really tough time. Uh, lunch, you know, coffee and all the fantastic facility meetings, so we are truly delighted that, you know, have a, a small, you know, but a very committed uh, room, so thanks for coming. My name is uh, Jacobo Quintanilla. I work as Community Engagement Advisor at the International Committee of the Red Cross, so literally up the hill, like 300 meters, so. It is an honor to be here in the UN discussing with a fascinating uh, panel of colleagues uh, a fascinating issue around data protection in humanitarian action. So without more delay, um, I'm just going to quickly introduce you to uh, our panel. Uh, but before we introduce the panel, we're going we're gonna to watch you know, a one-minute animation on the topic. So one minute, we'll be back with that.
decisions to humanitarian organizations in ensuring that they comply with personal data protection standards when carrying out their activities. After an initial analysis of the application of data protection principles to humanitarian action, the handbook considers the data protection implications for dealing with specific new technologies in the humanitarian sector. These include data analytics, drones, biometrics, cash transfer programming, cloud computing services, and messaging apps. Excellent. Thank you. So uh, to help us uh, uh, unpack this fascinating and very vast uh, topic, uh, we, gon we have a, a fantastic panel that I have the honor to moderate. Um, here next to me is uh, Alessandra Perucci, Consultative Committee Chair of the Convention 108 from the Council of Europe. Uh, Massimo Marellis, the Head of the Data Protection Office at the ICSC. Mila Romanov, uh, Legal and Data Privacy Specialist uh, from the UN Global Pulse from the United Nations. Uh, Brian Ford, Professor of the Centralized and Distributed Systems Lab. Uh, sorry, Brian, I, I really have to read this. Right. It's, um, from the EPFL here in, uh, in Switzerland, in Lausanne. And at the very end, uh, on the table is Alexandrine, Alexandrine uh, Pirlot de Corvian, Advocacy Officer from Privacy International. Um, so Massimo is going to, from the ICSC, is going to give us a little bit of, a re of an introduction to set the scene on what we're going to be discussing today and what is data protection in humanitarian action. Uh, the idea is we would like to have a uh, you know, live conversation. I mean, this is a very intimate uh, um, a scenario today, so we are, we are delighted. So please feel free to, uh, to jump with, with questions. The only reminder is, is that a question actually has a question mark at the end. So ask your questions and we'll try to answer uh, to the best of, of our capacity. So Massimo, the floor is yours. Thanks, Sako. Thank you very much, everybody, for uh, turning up in this intimate environment to have this uh, a discussion about a topic that for us is incredibly important. And it's, uh, it's a topic that has been keeping us busy for a long time, for uh, four years uh, at the ACRC and then two and a half years um, as part of a project that we led with the Brussels Privacy Hub. Um, and it's a project that really brought together a number of experts from academia, from uh, data protection authorities and privacy commissioners, from humanitarian organizations, from corporates that are involved in providing some of the services and technologies that we, we have addressed, uh, civil society, um, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and it's a process that led to the production of a handbook that will hopefully provide guidance in relation to the adoption and uh, use of certain new technologies in, in humanitarian work. It's, a, it's, a, it's been a long journey, and it's been a long journey that has been uh, marked by, by certain key steps and milestones. The first one that is probably worth mentioning and that uh, Alex will probably mention um, uh, when, when she will intervene is the report that was published in 2013 by PI, by Privacy International, on aiding surveillance. It was a little bit of a slap in the face of the humanitarian sector saying, guys, you are just uh, moving around very uh, volatile environments, uh, you're collecting lots of sensitive data, and inadvertently, without meaning to do anything bad, you are actually, the result of your action is that in many cases, you are facilitating surveillance and potentially repression by using certain new technologies. Subsequently, and uh, uh, the, the International Conference of Privacy and Data Protection Commissioners in 2015 adopted a resolution on data protection on privacy uh, and international humanitarian action where it was also highlighting that there were some issues around um, the use of new technologies in particular and humanitarian work. And it really committed the international conference and some of the, uh, uh, the data protection authorities and privacy commissioners to work with the humanitarian sector to come up with guidelines and, uh, and indications as to how certain new technologies can be used in, in humanitarian work. And 2015 was about the same time as we were sitting uh, at the same table as the Brussels Privacy, uh, Brussels privacy Hub and thinking there are people who are suggesting that we should start to fly drones, that we should use big data more, that we should uh, uh, use messaging apps, that we should uh, do many things. And obviously they're suggesting that because they're good ideas. They're, they're ideas that actually could make our work a lot more efficient and effective. Everybody has a sense that of unease, the sense that there's a lot that actually we don't know about the use of new technologies and the, and the implications of these technologies. And so we need to, to be able to really look into these technologies a little bit more closely and to understand how we can leverage those technologies in a, 
in a, in a way that is, uh, that is acceptable from a data protection point of view and that causes no harm. We really have an incredible panel today with a lot of expertise, authority, and, uh, and knowledge, and so I really don't want to take too much time from, uh, from, from the discussion, which I'm sure is going to be uh, very good. And also, I know that when people make their premise, generally they carry on for another half an hour, so I'm counting on Hako to slap me. As well, thank you very much, Marcelo. <laughs> so I've got a couple of things. So, um, but it's, uh, I just wanted to say a couple of words about why the work that we did was so, in a way, was so successful and worked out so well. It worked out so well because bringing together the community of humanitarian organizations and bringing together data protection authorities, civil societies, that, so civil society that looks at uh, issues around privacy is uh, something that brings together people that have a commonality of drivers and interest. Uh, to understand that, it's, uh, it's, I mean, it's important to understand who we are as humanitarian organizations. Humanitarian organizations, I'm speaking for the ACRC, in this case, uh, our work is to protect the life and dignity of victims of armed conflicts and other situations of violence and to provide them with assistance. Dignity in volatile environments. The concepts around data protection, the preamble of new convention, modernized convention 108 tells us that everything that it, we find in data protection instruments is there to reinforce and to strengthen the dignity of individuals when it comes to the processing of their personal data. And so the commonality of drivers is something that really brought us together. Um, protecting individuals, as I mentioned, is something that the ACRC has been doing for quite a long time, over 150 years. We tend to be quite happy about the way in which we, uh, we apply the principle of do no harm uh, in a physical environment. And so why this initiative now? And it's primarily because of new technologies. New technologies, as I mentioned, they, they give us the possibility to do much better uh, things in a way, or the same things in a more efficient and, uh, and faster way. And the humanitarian sector is indeed facing really major new challenges. We're facing conflicts that last longer. The average conflict these days is uh, of a duration of about 30 years. Um, and so having new technologies that enable us to uh, have programs around cash, for example, is something that is very useful. Conflicts become more volatile, uh, contexts become volatile and difficult to read, and using big data is something that can actually give us uh, value in understanding where we work and, and what needs to be done. We face increasing challenges around access, and when I'm talking about that, I'm really thinking about physical access, and I'm thinking about the colleagues that even just uh, over the last year uh, at the ACRC, eight, um, eight of our colleagues lost their lives, and I th if I think about the last five years, we're talking about over 50. So uh, having access to areas becoming, it becomes increasingly, increasingly complex, and so concepts around digital proximity, uh, when we cannot have physical proximity, become highly relevant. So thinking about messaging apps and thinking about uh, the using drones is, is becoming increasingly relevant. <coughs> so uh, in a way, data protection for us has been the tool that has enabled us to consider how to translate the principle of do no harm in a digital environment. And so I think this is the scene uh, that we, from which we start, and I think I've already taken far too much time, so I'll hand over to the panel. Uh, excellent, thank you very much, Massimo. Uh, before we, we crack on, how many of you work in the humanitarian or development sector? Excellent, just to get a sense you know, of, uh, and how many of you are working in the research, you know, academic? <laughs> Both. Any other sectors that we should be aware of? <laughs> okay, uh, just to get ahead, thank you very much. Um, so, as, as mentioned, we have a, we have a, a really a really good panel, um, and as, as Massimo mentioned, I think we go, we're going to try to unpack you know some of the some of the big uh, concepts and discussions that have been put together on this handbook on data protection and humanitarian action. Concretely, um, in the interest of this particular session, we're going to be focusing on four different but interrelated topic. The first one is around consent and the lawfulness of processing of data. The second one is about consent uh, and the lawfulness of processing data in the use of biometrics. Uh, the third topic we would like to discuss uh, is the handling of sensitive data and ethics, which is a fascinating topic as, as well. And last but not least, we're gonna be talking about the involvement and the collaboration with the private sector uh, and we're going to be looking in, in concrete more at cash transfers. Uh, but before we start, um, we, we would like to ask you um, a question. Wh wh who, who, can, who can tell us what is this? 
It is sorry. Excellent. So, how many of you have one of these? How, how many of you have one of these devices at home? Okay, nobody. How many of you are thinking of buying one for for Christmas or giving to, some, to someone for Christmas? Nobody here. Um, and how many of you? How many of you think that a smart speaker like this one is actually a threat to your own personal privacy? Only one, two, three. Okay, good. The rest, no opinion. Why, why, is it a, why is it a threat for your privacy, you think? Okay, well, the microphone is always on. So I heard, okay. Do you know, you think, or you know? <laughs> excellent. No, no, I think this is, a, this is a very interesting topic. I mean, we've been talking about data protection and humanitarian action, but hey, you know, um, actually Amazon can, can help you get out of jail, you know, uh, if you have done something that Amazon might have recorded, you know, as you said. So interesting to, to look into the the connection in between situations that we feel are far away in places like DRC, that's the picture that Massimo was showing earlier, uh, but also the reflection that has in our day to day life, which of course, you know, this is a, a, an incredible forum to have the discussions because that's exactly what we, one of the issues that we are very interested on. Okay, so moving on. Um, the first, uh, the first uh, topic, uh, as mentioned, is, uh, is we're going to be looking at consent and the lawfulness of processing. Um, and, and I, I understand, you know, looking at the, bo at the guide, you know, that the approach proposed uh, in, this, in this handbook se seems to be rather skeptical, Massimo, and I, let me get back to you, about the suitability of consent in humanitarian action. I think the, the, the concept of consent is interesting, and I would like by, if you could help us unpack, you know, what consent means, you know, in data protection in humanitarian action, Massimo. Uh, okay, me again. Uh, so, um, well, consent, uh, we will be hearing more also from, uh, from Alessandra afterwards, I'm sure, with, um, is, is a concept that is in data protection is, is being developed a lot lately to really mark the point that consent is a fully free expression of the will of an individual in full conscience of the risks and the benefit of a processing operation to have, um, to have their data processed by the controller. Um, and and why, why, is this a why is the handbook skeptical about this particular? Well, well, first of all, when we're talking about complex new technologies, already understanding what the risks and the benefits of processing might be very, very uh, difficult. Understanding, first of all, it requires a full understanding of who is involved in the processing, who are the various stakeholders that are in the loop, uh, where the data is going to go, which jurisdiction it's going to cross, who might be seeing the information, and so on. And we're talking also about environments where you saw the picture about uh, DRC, the environments where people are highly vulnerable. And so how can uh, an individual fully be, uh, be considered to be fully free the moment that they consent to, um, pro to you processing the data if that is the precondition to getting their food that day? And so if we're talking about biometrics registration, for example, or the use of cash programs, there are processing operations that involve a number of risks, and yet, people don't really have a lot of choice occasionally unless you provide them with the choice to do uh, other to, uh, to uh, accept um, aid in kind, which is not often manageable. Um, Alessandra, from, from your perspective, uh, uh, from the chair, from, you know, from chair, as a chair of the consultative committee of the Convention 108, uh, the Council of Europe, how does this analysis of consent uh, fit within the broader consideration about lawfulness of, of the processing of data? Well, let me say that uh, uh, traditionally consent and information on which consent is based have been always been the, the pillars for, for data protection. Um, it is not by chance, for example, that consent is even mentioned in the European Charter of Fundamental Rights when uh, uh, on the article on data protection. At the, at the same time, actually what Massimo was saying is absolutely right. Uh, we develop the awareness that consent cannot be a mere bureaucratic element uh, and must, be, must really reflect the uh, aware choice of the individual. So as Massimo was saying, there may be situations where consent cannot be collected for practical reasons. So, or there are situations where the imbalance uh, between, uh, let's say, the power of the data control controllers and the data subject uh, is uh, such that uh, the consent cannot be freely given. Mm -hmm. In all these cases, consent cannot constitute a, a 
valid legal basis for processing. And this is very much in the perspective of Convention 108. Let me just recall Please. one thing regarding Convention 108. Convention 108 is the Council of Europe uh, instrument for data protection. It is particularly relevant, at least for two reasons, um, because uh, um, it is uh, the only legally binding instrument at international level, and it is actually open to potentially every country of the world, because it can be ratified by countries which are not members as of the Council of Europe. It's not the case that it, is, that it has been ratified by 51 parties. And uh, uh, the Convention 108 is uh, undergoing a process of modernization. And in the text of the modernized convention mentioned by, by Massimo, by Massimo uh, we have a specific reference to the legal basis on which processing must be based. And consent uh, is, of course, uh, mentioned, but also other legal basis. Mm, this responds to the need not to, to abuse of consent when it's not uh, advisable. And uh, the attitude of the consultative committee also in interpreting this, uh, it's even that you should not use consent when it's not the appropriate legal basis. And, and what are the alternatives for, I mean, again, going back to the picture of, uh, of DSC, what are, the, what are the alternatives for humanitarian organization when, when consent is mm -hmm. not suitable? I mean, I think you mentioned what you talk about informed consent as, as, a, as a basis as well for that consent to be effective. So in some, yeah. of, in some of the places we work, there is not even a, a consciousness of what giving consent means. So you know, what are the alternatives that, that we have, if any, you know, within the humanitarian sector? Yeah, in speaking from the Council of Europe perspective, um, the modernized conventions speak about other legal bases laid down by law in a very general way, and uh, it's not the case. It's because the Convention 108 to speak to potentially every country and has mm -hmm. to use general principles. But you have a look at, uh, if you have a look at the explanatory memorandum of the modernized convention, which is uh, an important uh, interpretative instrument which accompanies Convention 108, you see that there are some other legal bases which could be used in humanitarian action. For example, when the processing is necessary for protecting the vital interest mm -hmm. of the individual, of the data subject, could or- you, Could you give us an example? Well, whenever um, uh, the, the, the processing is really necessary to protect uh, the security, for example, of the person, mm -hmm. her integrity, and uh, of course consent uh, is not available. And the other uh, legal basis which could be used uh, is uh, when the processing is uh, based uh, on grounds of public interest, uh, which is typical, I think, uh, of certain or humanitarian organizations which have in their mandate, uh, the, let's say, a specific public interest that they, they, they pursue. And uh, just to add something, yes. it's interesting to see that uh, in the explanatory report I was referring to, humanitarian action is uh, contemplated as uh, uh, an example of the use of this alternative basis. It says that sometimes the processing can be based on a combination of even two mm -hmm. legal bases like vital interest and uh, the public interest and humanitarian actions. Uh, for example, if you want some examples, mm -hmm. uh, when the processing is needed for uh, monitoring of life-threatening epidemic or for humanitarian emergency or for natural disasters uh, where you need to process data of missing persons. Uh, that could be another yeah. example. So let me ask you both. Uh, I mean, it is clear that in certain instances, humanitarian institutions have um, an exception that, you know, when it's not, well, consent is actually not suitable for that particular situation. But with that exception, I guess that we have also additional responsibilities. So what, what are those additional responsibilities that we have in the case, in the case when, when consent is not suitable? Uh, well, once uh, the legal basis has been de defined by uh, the data controller, I must say that the work uh, is not finished. Mm -hmm. I mean, the uh, definition of the correct legal basis for the data processing does not uh, exempt data controllers to comply with all the other data protection principles, uh, which are, for example, proportionality. I just wanted to, just to mention one of the most important ones. So you just have to process those data which are really necessary for your work mm -hmm. and not excessive data, for example. I would say that in a humanitarian action, one of the element uh, data controller should uh, care of uh, is uh, the so-called data protection impact assessment, uh, which means that whenever controllers 
before actually commencing a processing, they need to um, evaluate the implications of such processing on the fundamental rights and on individuals. So I think that uh, data protection impact assessment is a crucial element which has been introduced in the modernized convention, mm -hmm. and but also at the European level, of course, in the GDPR, you're probably familiar with, which must be really emphasized because it's a change of perspective. It means that it is up to data controllers to be responsible for the evaluation of their action on the personal data. And uh, of course, uh, uh, this means that, that they also have to adopt the adequate measures uh, to minimize the risk. Excellent, thank you. Uh, is there any comments on consent now here in the, in the table? Yeah, Mila. Uh, thank you. And uh, first of all, I would like to congratulate SDRC on the issuance of such a wonderful uh, uh, book, and ha handbook. Um, and um, yes, I would like to add, uh, uh, and I agree with everything that actually has been said. Um, one of the uh, one of the issues that we also experienced, and um, I work for the special initiative of the Secretary General on big data, is, is, is in particular in the big data context, is that uh, when um, when we encounter a situation with consent should have been thaw thought, is that um, the data digital literacy is one of the components that yeah. actually hinders the inf the, the, not the concept of informed consent. And uh, we noticed that though, you know, the, the, the capacity of individuals who are giving consent is crucial. And, some t and that's one of the reasons, for example, why uh, when sometimes consent, we think, is inefficient, is an efficient mechanism of, of data protection. Of course, not in every situation, but um, one example is, is when digital literacy uh, plays crucial role. Uh, and we usually, in our, in our, um, in our uh, actions and our activities, we always take into consideration um, the, um, the knowledge of the individual about privacy and r privacy risks. And one of the examples, just the recently published uh, a guidance note by the World Food Program, which is, a, um, a, which is part of the United Nations organization, they also mentioned that in order to um, provide in or obtain informed consent, the individual, the data subject, needs to be aware of the risks that come with the mm -hmm. data use. And um, that's what you uh, re uh, referring to, right? The privacy impact assessment comes into play. So even if sometimes we seek consent, I think it's important, and we, we actually, at the United Nations, we insist on going back and making sure that the, the consent that has been sought is effective and informed, and that's done through the risk assessment. We're gonna talk about, uh, about uh, consent and informed consent. We're gonna talk about this, I think, more in detail in the, in the section later on on ethics. Um, but thanks, you know, very much, you know, for, uh, for uh, the reflection on, on, on consent and the lawfulness of uh, data processing. Um, I, would like to, I would like to move, in the interest of time, I would like to move, you know, and, and, and query Alex uh, at the end of the table here. Alex, uh, in 2013, you guys at Privacy International published a very important report called Aid in Surveillance, which is, you know, Massimo just mentioned. The report highlighted, uh, among a number of issues, you know, something very critical and alarming back then and still current today, I think, uh, around the use as misuse of biometrics uh, in humanitarian action um, because it can cause unexpected but severe, but severe sorry, harm to people affected by crisis. Uh, can you give us uh, a little bit of a rundown on what you guys are learning on that particular, on that particular report? And mm -hmm. I would love you to do connections on how relevant, you know, four years down the line, some of these findings are still today. Thank you. Yeah. First of all, thank you very much for the opportunity to, to be part of this panel. Um, as mentioned earlier, and you can see uh, on the slide, this is a report that Price International published back in 2013. Um, and at the time when we published, there was little attention um, paid to uh, what we said in terms of the interests. Um, but then since then, there's been a real change, um, both from the privacy community, but also from the humanitarian development community. Um, and I want to make the point that this is not just about humanitarian aid, but also the development um, sector as well. And what this report provided us the opportunity to link different aspects of our work. Uh, we're looking at communication surveillance and surveillance in general by state actors and the private sector. Uh, but at the same time, we were recipient of um, development funding for our own activities. Uh, and we felt like it was our responsibility as well to be looking at this sector and how they're using uh, new technologies and, and advancements um, to generate and process uh, more data as well uh, to enable and facilitate their activities. And when it came to biometrics, um, what we noticed, well, our problem analysis was um, 
was also to think back around what are the pressures that these communities were facing around being more accountable, transparent, um, you know, having less funding in this sphere and having to be more efficient um, as well. And so what we saw is that technology and biometrics was being seen as a panacea to kind of solve all of this problem, to be able to do the data trail from the moment that you get the funding to the beneficiary that would receive it, to know how many people were benefiting, ensuring that people didn't get more aid uh, that they were meant to and that it was going to the right places. So there's all questions around identification, authentication as well of beneficiaries, um, but supporting as well uh, humanitarian and development actors um, who are enabling and, and providing this assistance as well. And as Massimo put it, even though I think the community saw it as a, a damning report, for us it was also an important opportunity as well to just start the dialogue on this issue that we weren't having before. Um, and I think that's been a huge change. Um, so when it came to biometrics, the further problem I asked is that it came through from some of the um, case studies that we're looking at um, was a lack of understanding as to what biometric information um, really provided in terms of personal information about individuals um, and that ultimately could be used uh, for surveillance purposes um, as well. There was also ethical dimensions as well, uh, as mentioned several times on this, uh, on this panel already. What we're talking about are individuals that are in the most vulnerable positions, having, you know, being asked um, to get their fingerprints or to get their iris uh, scans. Um, and when you can imagine the sort of context in which this is happening as well, there were not only just privacy implications, but also ethical ones. Um, and then when it came to the technologies themselves, the diverse use of technologies from fingerprints to photographs um, to also iris scans, um, but then there wasn't very little questioning as to um, the, the safeguards that needed to be in, in place. What, were, what would happen if any of that data was accessed by individuals who shouldn't have access to it or who had malicious intentions or who are being you know, uh, reckless and not knowing what the risks would be and not providing the necessary safeguards either at the point of collection of that data or when it was being stored. Um, and, and the harm is real. Uh, so one of the things we, we mention in the report is um, the Egyptian ID system um, that was actually funded by the uh, Danish um, aid um, program, um, where the authorities you know, basically came out and said, yes, we use um, the biometric information for surveillance um, of different groups that are recipients of, of aid, for example. Um, the other aspect which for us was very problematic was this control, the lack of control of some of the actors that were using biometric information. Uh, a lot of these actors are dependent on the private sector either to provide um, the, the equipment, to collect it, to store it, to maintain it, uh, and as soon as you have third parties involved, you lose that control. So while different development agencies, humanitarian agencies were you know, adopting mechanisms for the protection of data and of their beneficiaries, um, it was really hard for them to make sure that the data, the data life cycle um, also at every point being the storage use and further processing was also being, um, you, you know, integrated within broader safeguards as well. And so what role would that private sector be doing, particularly when it comes to biometrics when the main providers of biometric um, technologies are also you know, companies that provide surveillance equipment. And so what was the agenda of these different actors um, as well? And then finally, maybe a last point on the problems that we're seeing was also the dependence. So once somebody had created a biometric system, um, people were like, well, let's fine, let's, we'll also use it. And so this dependence on, on this data that already exists and then building on it and making it bigger than it was supposed to be and using it for different purposes um, as well. Um, we're going we're gonna to unpack a little bit more the, the, you know, a couple of the, the issues that you touch uh, now in your, in your, um, in your uh, points, uh, in your remarks. We're going to be talking about digital preparedness, you know, within the humanitarian sector. I think Brian is going to help us unpack some of these issues and also uh, we have a, a whole section on, on the private sector, uh, which I think is, is very timely and relevant yeah. uh, in you know, looking at some of the recent events happening in the, in the sector. Um, I think, I mean, a question maybe for you both, you know, Alex and Alexandra, and, and feel free others to jump in. Uh, mm -hmm. in, in the humanitarian sector, in the humanitarian, in humanitarian action, do, do we actually have, or is, there is, is there any, is there an appropriate legal basis for the, pro for the processing of biometric data? We just, we just take biometric data and have to figure it out, or how does it work? Well, yeah. <laughs> oh, maybe on, I think. 
And yes. by the way, Alex, okay. uh, congratulations for not mentioning the word blockchain, you know, during your <laughs> presentation. That was, that was really, you know, heartwarming. Thank you. Alexander. Well, uh, bio uh, biometric data, which is definitely part of the so-called sensitive data or special categories of data, uh, generally speaking and ideally, uh, should be based on uh, a very strong, uh, explicit consent. Uh, but again, we are going back to what we were saying before, that there may be situation where consent is not that idle. So once again, we may try <coughs> to work on the other legal bases we could assist. And uh, I would repeat what I was saying before. So again, the vital interest and uh, the, the public interest may be um, some relevant basis uh, to be used. In the awareness that, of course, the level of caution must be very, very high for the risks that we heard before. And it was, I think, also very honest, I think, in the handbook uh, when it was uh, underlined the possibility that once biometric data are used, that they are susceptible to be also used, for example, by public authorities for other purposes as law enforcement. Uh, that's quite a relevant issue, I would say, that has to do with uh, fundamental rights and uh, freedoms. Um, and uh, I was saying about, I was speaking about a special caution Again, here, the data protection impact assessment I referred to must be, is particularly relevant uh, because the risks are very, very high and that the uh, measures which counterbalance the risks must be very, very high as well. Uh, as well as, of course, as security, which is crucial. For Alex, uh, and I, I so want to warn all of us that we have 25 minutes yeah. uh, to go. Just a, maybe just a, a last point on that. I think it is good that we're exploring different um, legal grounds for, for processing. Um, having said that, and it's not just on, on the work of the humanitarian, but also development sector, one thing that we're also trying to challenge is the problem analysis that's being done by the different actors as to do you really need to be collecting biometric information? You know, some of the justifications given are around, you know, fraud, uh, double dipping into aid funding, corruption. Um, but because there's no baseline, and we have asked different organizations to tell us, you know, what is this amount of fraud that you're trying to solve, you know, address? If that is more, is less than the cost of you deploying a massive biometric system, then you should really rethink whether that is actually solving your problem when we know actually, to be honest, that a lot of the corruption is happening not even at the beneficiary level, but at the project and program management level. So maybe challenging that even the justification for the resorting to such technology. Okay, so I think you know, it's, it's, th it's, three, it's 336 and I think as of right now, I think we are all clear that uh, the data protection law, in data protection law, sensitive data is clearly, is clearly defined, a defined term that comes with a specific legal obligations, correct? Uh, however, um, definitions by themselves, you know, s might, not take that, might, not take, might not take us you know, as far as, uh, as we want and may not do, do that much. Um, I think as Mila mentioned, what what constitutes uh, sensitive data can vary across context and very importantly can vary across how much people understand, you know, what sensitive data is or uh, what consent means actually. Um, so Brian, I think you've been working with, with, with Massimo and colleagues at the SCRC for quite some time looking at uh, research on, on how sensitive humanitarian information can be secured in a digital environment. So my question to you is what are, uh, as of today, from a technical point of view and, you know, making it accessible to everybody in the room, the main cybersecurity and privacy challenges that you think human organization organizations you know, face today? Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, good. So, so from, a, from a technical perspective, I, I really see three major areas of challenges, uh, three, you know, three really uh, grand challenges in this space, which I, I think uh, in the humanitarian sector are just kind of vastly amplified versions of security and privacy challenges that everybody faces throughout the world, but, but they're much worse in the humani humanitarian context. So the first, uh, uh, the first is the way um, people, the way humanitarian organizations, the tools, uh, technical tools humanitarian organizations can use to communicate and interact both internally and with their clients. Things like messaging apps, biometrics, uh, you know, these kinds of tools. Um, uh, in general, the commercial, commercially available tools tend to be developed primarily with convenience, attractiveness, functionality in mind, with security added as an afterthought. And like I said, this is a problem for everybody, but especially a huge problem in the humanitarian context. 
Um, uh, for example, um, uh, uh, and, and this is a, a especially a problem because in humanitarian contexts, often, uh, often in many parts of the world, uh, the, um, the tools that humanitarian workers have to use to uh, communicate and interact with clients are, are tightly constrained by what's actually available, what the local population understands, can accept, uh, or is commonly used, like maybe only SMS is really available. And a lot of these uh, technologies are extremely uh, uh, insecure, vulnerable to sur surveillance in all sorts of respects. Um, some of the, some, you know, for example, messaging apps are better than others in terms of uh, these respects, but even the best available currently um, uh, are, are still uh, extremely vulnerable in other ways, like they, they, uh, they leak uh, even if they protect um, the content of communication end to end, they still leak metadata like, like crazy, like, like who's talking to whom, um, you know, at what times when you're even online versus offline, even if you're not talking, things like that, and that can be extremely sensitive and vulnerable to surveillance. Um, and uh, the, the technologies that are, that can potentially, um, uh, you know, pr provide further protection are not really mature or, or, or usable, widely usable enough. So that's, that's the, kind of the, the grand challenge when it comes to the tools that humanitarian uh, uh, use to interact with uh, especially client uh, populations. So the second major grand challenge, I'd say, is the management, uh, collection and management of data itself, the, the, uh, the processes. And here is where uh, um, uh, uh, cloud computing, for example, comes in. The, the push toward, toward more centralized mod uh, models of data storage and management um, cloud computing is extremely attractive for uh, uh, both economically uh, and fun in terms of convenience and functionality. And in the short term, it's very ad it's even attractive from a security perspective because it re relies on less IT and security expertise out out at the edges of the network, where it's extremely you know difficult and expensive to find really you know sophisticated people in you know remote offices and stuff. And it you know centralizes the expertise where it's more uh, you know economic uh, more uh, economically practical. So. But unfortunately, this short-term security advantage comes with an enor enormous long-term, longer-term systemic risk of, uh, of uh, creating giant caches of data with very large targets on them, They're extremely attractive to all sorts of, uh, uh, you know, potentially adversarial entities around the world, from ordinary hackers to, to uh, unscrupulous governments and spy agencies. And the, the cloud security model, most of this cloud technology uh, is designed in such a way that only a single compromise, human or computer, at some critical point can, uh, can enable the, complete, the, 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 the entire cache of data to be stolen and exfiltrated in bulk as a whole. And so, that, so it's basically an enormous systemic risk that you know, I'm not sure that people are, are sufficiently aware of. Um, uh, and n now there are, uh, since somebody already uh, uh, brought up the blockchain uh, buzzword, I will feel free to do go for it. to follow suit. So there is promise, you know, there's a lot of hype around blockchain and there is promise in the concept uh, and it's, it's really just a new version of a very old concept of splitting trust, uh, decentralizing trust. Unfortunately, Practically all of the so-called blockchain solutions that are actually being pushed by major vendors being, being sold as products now are really just repackaged cloud technologies that don't have, that don't really have any security benefits and are still vulnerable to single points of compromise and failure. So, so you know, kind of even in that space, it's worth being in, incredibly cautious. So, uh, so um, uh, yeah, so that's the second area. And managing and storing data. The thir third area I see is actually processing data, uh, the third grand challenge. Uh, and, and this is where, you know, the, kind of the attractiveness of big data, machine learning, you know, there's a lot of uh, very attractive tools coming out. You know, once you have centralized data, there's a lot of very attractive things you can do with it. Um, but 
uh, you know, of course, there's also huge risks. Now, there are standard practices such as anonymization, pseudo pseudonymization. Those definitely, and the handbook covers those, those def definitely help to reduce risks. Uh, with with the collection with how data can be misused, but no no anonymization or uh, pseudonymous te uh, pseudonymization techniques can really eliminate the risk uh, these risks entirely, uh, because uh, because of you know well known ways that even anonymized data can be put together with other data sources to to reduce the privacy and de anonymize things. Um, there there is of course. <coughs> Uh, um, technology that's uh, kind of uh, just coming out, gra gradually coming out, uh, that allows um, uh, uh, that allows the processing, even even processing by sophisticated machine learning techniques, uh, in more privacy sensitive ways. For example, processing data uh, while it remains encrypted and inaccessible to every uh, to anyone. But th this whole class of technology is much less mature, not really available. Yet, and even when it is available, it's orders of magnitude more, you know, uh, slower, more expensive in terms of processing costs and let stuff. Me, so let me, let me pick it here. Uh, so it's, it's 3.45 3.45 in Geneva. We're going to launch right now a very unscientific poll with all of you. So from 10 to 1, 10 being very prepared, 1 not being prepared at all. How do you think, how much, how, how prepared are human organizations when it comes to facing the cyber security threats. So I'm going to start counting from 10 to 1. 10, very prepared. 1, not prepared at all. So 10, 9, 8, 7. Huh? Ah? <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll so let's get to zero after we, we have a question <laughs> about that. 3, I mean 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 1, okay. 0, <laughs> minus 1, minus 2, minus 1. Okay, thanks, Ben. <laughs> um, uh, perfect. So. Uh, <laughs> I don't think I'm going to put these questions to the, to the, because I don't think there's much to debate, you know, per se right now. But I think, you know, as, as mentioned, we wanted to talk, to talk about digital preparedness, and, and it seems pretty obvious that there is a lot that needs to happen. Um, so let's, let's uh, I mean, let, let's, let's move to the next, you know, particular challenge, you know, that we have, we have extracted, you know, from the, and thanks very much, Brian, we have extracted from the handbook. Uh, Mila, um, in relation to, to data analytics, and, you know, you work in the UN Global Poll, so you know, big data is your, is your bread and butter, among other things. Um, you, you know, the, the handbook uh, talks about data analytics and big data and how they pose a challenge when it comes to data sets that individually treated are not sensitive, but, you know, with some of these processing capacities, they become highly sensitive and, and potentially harmful for, for, peop for affected people. Um, can you give us a, a couple of examples to illustrate, you know, this particular? Um, thank you so much for the question. Yes, and before I actually br present a few examples, um, what I want to mention is that right now we are actually in discussion at the, UN, at the UN on this particular topic, right? And it's not only in the context of big data, but in, in privacy and data in general. Because I think now talking about big data separately from personal data is kind of, I think it's, it's a quite, it's a gray area. So that's why I'll speak from, uh, from both perspectives. So um, right now at the United Nations, there is a, there is a working group um, that w works actually on updating and modernizing uh, the privacy policies across the system. And one of the questions that came up is uh, the inclusion and consideration of sensitive data versus non-sensitive data. And one of the questions that, that, that has been discussed not only within the UN but also by the UN Special Rapporteur um, is group privacy. And I think that's where we can make a link to sensitive data, and in especially when it comes to big data. Um, and now let me explain you why. Um, what is group privacy? Right now there is really no, not su no, no such n notion what group privacy actually means. There are some research that is ongoing. The UN Special Rapporteur mentioned that there needs to be more done. Um, on, on understanding group privacy, uh, group risks, um, uh, risks to group privacy as well as group harms. And um, sensitive data becomes sensitive when we are, for example, aggregating, uh, we're receiving data from private sector parties, right? And the data comes in aggregated form. Um, we don't particularly use to target any specific individual. However, in, just imagine, in a humanitarian context, um, you were talking about groups of um, people who are voting, right, or voting against a, per a particular government. Um, and 
that government can go after the, those people, the groups of people, and persecute them um, if that a group, particular group, is identified. We're not speaking about, about one individual, right, two. Uh, we're speaking about groups of people in a particular area. So this is a question of not individual privacy anymore. It's actually a question of group harms that could be caused to an identified group, to a group of people. So I think um, that's one particular example where um, when non-sensitive data, right, and our notion of sensitive personal data because be suddenly becomes, becomes non-personal but yet sensitive. And um, in our recently published um, United Nations Development Group note um, here, uh, there is a printout, uh, but uh, it's also available online. We speak about group privacy and group harms, and it's especially non-sensitive data is mentioned through group harms in this uh, particular part. Um, also, I would like to suggest is that um, the, miti uh, the mitigation risks, I think, are crucial. Uh, the mitigation of the risk is crucial when it comes to group privacy. When we speak about privacy impact assessment, we're no longer speaking again about personal privacy or individual privacy. Um, just recently, we I issued a privacy impact assessment tool, which talks about actually, which is called a risk assessment tool. It's no longer privacy impact assessment. It's a risks, harms, and benefits assessment tool that takes into consideration not only individual privacy, but group harms in the context of human rights. And um, with that, I'd like to suggest that when we speak about sensitive data, there is types of personal sensitive data that we're all used to, right? But then there's, I think it's important to distinguish between non-personal data that is also used in sensitive context. So I think this is a kind of a critical distinction. I have a quick, quick question. I mean, you mentioned mitigation, uh, mitigation measures to, you know, to try to, to, to prevent and to, uh, to counter some of these potential risks. Um, I think, Alessandra, you mentioned initially data protection impact assessments. You just mentioned an, an impact assessment tool as well. Um, so who is responsible for implementing these measures? Okay, it's my own organization, whoever I work for. Mm -hmm. um, is, there, is there a third independent body who actually, who actually polices a, as well, you know, who, I mean, how we do this? Because I think a toolkit by itself might not be very helpful, right? But how we can ensure a certain degree of quality on those assessments? Uh, so I'll give you, a sp you asked for examples, so I'll give you a specific Please, example. Please, we love examples. Uh, and the example is actually from our own work. So as I mentioned, we just recently published the, I would say the first phase of the risks, harms, and benefits assessment tool. And currently the second part of it, which is more comprehensive one, is being developed. Um, so the, what the tool actually recommends and the whole mechanism we're implementing is actually considering, uh, first of all, that this, um, the, not the privacy expert is performing the tool. The key here is the person who is actually handling the data, mm -hmm. the project manager, right? So it could be the, the person in the, within the humanitarian organization, or maybe if the, um, if the project is outsourced to a third party, then the third party should perform the project. However, th however there is a crucial link of due diligence and um, understanding that it's not only that one person that must perform the privacy impact assessment. So we're encouraging the uh, involvement of various uh, skill sets into the process. So besides having legal and privacy people, we also have data experts and data engineers that are part of the process, the mm. consultation process. But that's not where it ends. Um, another important element, and I think, and I would encourage everyone to think about it, is that when international organizations are implementing their mandates um, in different countries in different contexts, we're talking about saving, for example, people's lives in humanitarian context, right? So it affects human lives. It affects vulnerable populations. So we need to understand the cultural and social context. And how do we do that? We need to have experts or representatives of those uh, of, the, of that country or that particular group that is involved in the assessment process. So let, let me stop you there, and I think I would like to bring up you know, something that Brian mentioned earlier uh, uh, in his earliest point, short-term advancements vis-a-vis uh, -vis or versus, you know, long-term risks. Um, and I think this, is, this, this brings, you know, uh, nicely, you know, one of our favorite topics, you know, which is ethics, you know, when it comes to all these issues around data protection. And in humanitarian crisis, you know, sometimes we have, or, you know, particularly the recipients, you know, of our support might feel that, Exactly, your emergency is actually my pilot. So how, how do we go about, how do we bridge the gap? How do we strike a balance uh, between the need for experimentation and innovation and as Massimo mentioned, the do no harm principle? Who wants to take that, Alex? Actually, I wanna respond to a, a quick thing around the risk assessment because also based on what Brian was saying. Very quick, please, um, because yeah, we are really, really quickly, tight it's just on time. 
it's great that we're doing risk assessment, privacy assessments, they need to be part of the work that we do, but given how little information we know about how these technologies operate, the services operate, um, we're not able, we don't have the information, unfortunately, because private companies are not sharing how, how they are designing them, implementing them, that we can't make the best risk assessment we can because we just don't have access to that information. So that's just a call out to the private sector around transparency and accountability. We're gonna come to that point if we actually can, you know, before four o'clock. Uh, and, and in fact, you know, um, Privacy International, Alex is, is working, we're working with Alex on, uh, on uh, research on humanitarian metadata. This is a follow-up on a report that we commissioned last year on messaging apps in the humanitarian sector with, Privacy Inter with uh, the engine room and block party. You can find it online. So. If we have time, we'd love to talk about, you know, what we can do or cannot do when it comes to uh, the big, you know, tech giants. Um, so, you know, how do we strike, you know, in, 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 in a tweet, you know, how do we strike a balance between experimentation, innovation, and do no harm, Massimo? Uh, okay, since, uh, since nobody wants to take it, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. I, uh, you know, when, when you talk about innovation and piloting and doing things, the mantra seems to be, uh, innovation is about testing and failing, and it works in some environment. It works. It works in some uh, uh, commercial applications, and uh, you know, if uh, a particular application to get you for, with a taxi from one place to another works or not, yeah, you can test it and fail it. But when you're really working with the life of people, you cannot test and fail. Uh, certainly, you cannot fail. And so, what it what it requires is actually having a proper risk analysis done well before. We do not test on live data. And uh, so it's, it's really about having a very clear idea through, uh, it's been mentioned a few times, and it sounds like the solution to everybody's problems is, is an impact assessment, mm -hmm. but it actually is, because it is the tool that brings data protection to life. You start with clearly understanding who the stakeholders are, where the data goes, and actually, sometimes it's surprising how you talk to people who are suggesting a solution, and the, the moment you start digging, they actually don't know who's involved in the processing of the information, who the, the sub-processors might be. So you start with that, you start to question, what is the advantage of what you're proposing? Be because already there, it's a question that has been mentioned before. Sometimes the, the moment you start to challenge the advantage that has been uh, proposed, you realize that it's maybe just because the tool looks cool uh, that has been proposed without actually having a sense of what is the real advantage. And, and so going through the risks is what enables us to understand before piloting how to, uh, what, what the implications might be, and then to be able to take a, an accountable risk-based decision. Uh, excellent, so we literally have uh, just a few minutes. Um, we wanted to talk about the relationships with the corporate uh, sector, you know, what is the involvement and you know, social partnerships and collaborations, but I think in the interest of time, I think we're gonna try to touch on something broader, you know, a little bit greater, which is, a little bit of a reality check, you know, in the last three minutes of this discussion. Um, we just fully, you know, understanding or, or grasping, you know, the impacts of some of these companies. Or maybe, you know, you all here in the room might be more aware that the, that the usual, you know, that the regular citizen, the power of some of these corporations that basically run by, li by lives, our lives, sorry, by algorithms and, and artificial intelligence. So looking at the panel, what do you guys think is the, is the real ability that governments and humanitarian organizations have to actually influence the power of these big, you know, tech corporations, you know, the, the tech of church that we have here in the, in the screen, when it comes to, uh, you know, operating in the benefit of the public. And I'm, I'm looking at you here, Alessandra, to start with as you yes. work for the Council of Europe. Yes. How, much, how much leverage do you guys have? <laughs> to bring people to the, to the book? Well, I think that uh, with the uh, increasing recourse to big data, artificial, in, uh, artificial intelligence, uh, um, algorithms, uh, there's also an increasing need for two elements, mm -hmm. I would add. Transparency, which is the most obvious one. Yesterday, I actually took part uh, in another session on big data, and what clearly emerged also from the audience uh, was that one of the main concerns in respect of big data is the sort of intrinsic opacity which characterize uh, the decisions which are taken by uh, big data, by the use of big data. In this, uh, in this sense, the, the work of the Council of Europe Committee is uh, to ensure as much as possible that transparency mm -hmm. is guaranteed, mm -hmm. which doesn't mean to go into the secrecy of the algorithms, 
-hmm. It's not like that. It's just to render intelligible to individuals what are the mechanisms, I would add obscure mechanisms mm -hmm. of processing which may lead to uh, decisions, uh, consequences uh, which have repercuss repercussions on the private sphere of the individual. That's the first element. And the other thing I would add is uh, I think that in this context uh, there's um, um, a need to emphasize the role of human intervention. Uh, this is uh, w something which was uh, very much considered where in the modernized convention there was the introduction of the right not to be subject to automated decisions. So the idea is that the individual can still have a word when and not cannot be simply subject to decisions whose mechanism behind is totally obscure. I think that in a few words, these are two main elements we may work on. Let me, uh, Massimo, and after I, I want to run through the, through the panel. What do you see are the, are the main legal implications that an institution like the SCRC may have to partner with, with some of these third, you know, independent, sorry, commercial, you know, third parties? Well, it's, a, it's, it's a big question. In a nutshell. It is. In, in, a in, nutshell. in a nutshell. <laughs> and it's a, it's a massive question. and. Uh, um, legal implications, well, first of all, you start to lose control of the information uh, that you collect and for which you are responsible the moment that you start to involve third parties. And so uh, you have a number of responsibilities under law to actually ensure that uh, all the necessary measures are put in place to avoid that loss of control and to avoid that the guarantees that you provide to individuals mm -hmm. under your rules and under your principles are not lost for those individuals the moment that you start to use external sources. So, so the responsibilities are huge. The first one, start, uh, the, uh, and the most basic, is to have a clear understanding of what is happening with an external processing operation. Because only then you can understand how to uh, ensure that you comply with the law. Excellent. Uh, Mila, uh, perceive this is real influence that we have with some of these companies. What's, what's your take? Um, well, I'll, I'll have an overall general message to answer your question. Um, I think what we need, and I think what the United Nations in particular is in position of doing, is actually bringing all the governments together, along with the private sector stakeholders mm -hmm. and the humanitarian sector. And I think there is a huge gap currently in, in this collaboration point, where we don't have a proper framework for addressing the needs of humanitarian sector working with private sector. So I think that's one key point that uh, we need to address. And in these frameworks, are first of all, missing the awareness of public, uh, not only on the risks of privacy, uh, but also on the risks of not using the data mm -hmm. when it comes to, if uh, particular discussion of this topic, humanitarian emergency. And um, the sec and also in, in the context of a broader spectrum of the sustainable develop achievement of sustainable development goal. And the third point I'd like to make is the uh, human rights aspect here. Um, it, was, it has also been mentioned in the report of the UN Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Privacy that we need to think of privacy in conjunction, of human rights in conjunction with, with all of the rights with each other, and not just one right at a time. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where we, that's, that's what the framework that currently needs to exist in order to tackle the questions that you have. Excellent. Sorry, it's, it's really short. Uh, and, you know, I would like to finish with both Brian and Alexa. Brian, I think, you know, I, if I understand well, I think Twitter went from 140 to 180 characters recently. So what's your 280 character, you know, for, <laughs> to wrap up, to wrap up, you know, the session? And, and I will go with Alex so in afterwards. In terms of influencing uh, as, a, as a technology. 27 characters already. <laughs> <laughs> so don't underestimate the power of both humanitarian organizations working together and with, with uh, privacy conscious governments to influence the way the private sector, the types of products the private sector will build uh, and, and will open up and increase transparency when there's enough critical mass of demand for it. Excellent. Alex, what me message do you want to leave behind today for these people who have to leave to the next session?
so they wouldn't have made that decision because they're encoding and use different services um, and, and technology. So yeah, it's about challenging that business model um, as well. Excellent. So uh, this is a beautiful handbook that has been created you know, by the SSC in partnership with uh, a number of organizations and colleagues from here. So please uh, download it, read it. Uh, we have to wrap up here, unfortunately. Obviously, this is a topic that you know, it is, we've done, we try to do a fair job to the, to the book and to the topic. Uh, of course, this is to be continued. If you guys have some questions, please come and talk to, uh, to our colleagues here. And uh, thanks very much for coming and see you in the next edition of this fascinating episode. Okay, thank you very much. You have a question, please come, uh, because we, we, are, we are aware that people have to, uh, have to go, so. And Jacobo has to catch a taxi to go to the airport. Actually, yes, I have to go, but I know it's, we also have an hour only, so we should be respectful with everybody's time. Thank you very much. I hope that you enjoy it. I had a lot of fun. Good. <laughs> thank you. And I told you, at least, you know, at, least it, at least it was meant to be fun. Okay, so Ciao. thank you very much. Thank you. Have a great Christmas. Thanks for, thanks for, thank you for the moderation. Five and go to the airport. And you, I don't remember. No, tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. Okay.